gentlemen, if you will, make the way in your seats, but don't sit down. Let's all stand together as we sing great things. Sunday evenings uh, in the fellowship hall. 
uh, if you are interested in that or have any questions about that, I know he would love to talk to you about it. Uh, again, we have a video for Operation Christmas Child this morning. As we talk about at this time of year, Operation Christmas Child is a wonderful mission carried out by Samaritan's Purse in which we can give in a way that, that helps people that we may never meet uh, face to face. We can pack these shoe boxes, and these shoe boxes are taken to the, to the edges uh, of civilization, to, the, to the, just countless places in the world where the gospel can be taken to these children. So if you would, just watch this video real quick. Out of three, when children open the shoe boxes, they're so excited. Those faces just transform. Yeah, these kids behind me are so excited because they've just received their boxes. The mouth is wide open, the voice is raised, smiles are all over. That box brings joy. We're right now in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. I mean, it's just been incredible. Kids are so excited, giving them a gift, do it in Jesus' name, and that's what this is all about. Jesus loves you. It's a gospel opportunity. It's the chance for the children to change the entire life. That's what I love about Operation Christmas Child. It knows no borders, it knows no boundaries. It's all about sharing the name of Jesus Christ. Churches are doing big things with Operation Christmas Child. Everybody out there who packs shoe boxes, they are spreading God's love. It's families, it's churches, it's hundreds of thousands of volunteers that help make Operation Christmas Child so successful. We couldn't do it without them. With this box, they do get the gospel story. They do hear about Jesus. It has maximum impact in the worldwide kingdom of Christ. I mean, what better thing could you do than be involved in fill shoe boxes? Some of them go by train, some go by camels, some go by ships. These boxes go all over the world, and that is only the beginning. After receiving the shoe boxes, the children will be invited to go to the greatest journey, which is a 12 lesson discipleship program where they learn about the greatest gift, which is Jesus Christ. After a child completes the greatest journey, they graduate and receive a Bible in their own language. When the light of the gospel is turned on, that changes everything. Churches are being planted, lives are being changed, communities are being transformed. The word of God is spreading. The gospel is advancing. It is impacting children. It is impacting families. It is impacting the world greatly. Thank you for praying. Thank you for giving. I would like to ask you to consider packing shoeboxes year-round. God will bless, and God will use your gift to touch the life of a child and to be able to do it in Jesus' name. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of it. God bless each and every one of you. So if you have not already, as you can see, we've already got some that have already been brought back. We have other shoe boxes that are ready to take home and be packed out in the lobby right now. If you've not done one yet, or if you've already done one, you want to do more. Uh, so if you have not brought one back, or if you're planning on getting one, bring it back, just make sure they need to be here by November the 15th. So in two weeks, we need to have them here so that they can be sent to the distribution center so that they can be shipped out in time for Christmas. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this morning. God, we thank you for the opportunity to come here into your house, to gather as believers, God, to worship your holy name. 
God, I pray as we enter into this time of worship through, through song, through the preaching of your word, God, that we would just focus on you. Now, there's so much that this year has thrown at us. There are so many things that this year has, has, has tried to, to distract and, and remove our focus from you, God. But, Lord, we thank you for the fact that we are able to still gather, that we are still able to come together, God, and worship you. God, we thank you for the opportunities to spread your gospel. Like with these shoeboxes, God, we thank you for the fact that there are still ways through, through technology and through various other means, God, that we can reach the world with your truth, with your love. And God, as we come into this time of worship, Lord, as your word says, give us clean hands and pure hearts, God. Let us come into this time ready to, to focus on you, ready to worship you, God, ready to magnify you. And we pray it all in your holy and your precious Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Well, the smiles on those kids' faces, that is precious. So please do your part. Let's all stand together. We sing together. Holy is the Lamb.
You have to wake up and say yes. Yes, yes, I'm glad that you're here. I will talk for just a moment, if you'll allow me to, about politics. Can you do that in church? Oh, don't ever bring politics in a church. Let me share something with you. Our theology determines every arena of our lives if Jesus is king. If Jesus is king, our theology determines every area of our lives, including politics. In fact, our theology drives politics in our lives. And so what I want to say is go vote because your children and your grand grandchildren's future and lives depend upon it. I want to read to you Proverbs 21.1. It says, The king's heart is like the channels of water in the hands of the, of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. He turns it wherever he wishes. What does that mean? It means that it doesn't matter if it's a Democrat that goes in office or a Republican that goes in office. We have no need to fear because our God is omnipotent. He is in charge. We may not like this. We may not like that. We may not like this candidate or that candidate. But I'm telling you, it doesn't matter. God is going to work out his will in the life of everything that is happening. But we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to show by our vote where we stand. We don't have to agree with everything. No one agrees with everything. I don't even agree with myself sometimes, okay? But that's the way it is. We have to look at what the Word of God says and get as much in line with it as we can. But go vote. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this nation. Lord, you know the difficulty that we're in. God, I know what your will is regarding this election, but I know what your will is regarding what we're to do as humans. Lord, as people of faith, we are to honor you by exercising the freedom that you've given us, by making the choice from a theological point of view for every candidate as best we can understand. We ask for your wisdom, God, but we ask above all that no matter what, that as believers in you, Lord, Whatever happens that will not exalt one as God and the other is wrong. But Father, we will very simply make you Lord of our lives and show up the way that we live. No matter what this world does, and no matter what the outcome is, to lift you up, God, and to proclaim you as Lord. And God, that we believe and we look forward to the day when every knee will bow. When our knee will bow before you in thanksgiving for what you did for us on Calvary, God. The Son of Glory, God Himself coming in flesh, loving us, caring for us, dying for us. Oh Lord, we will willingly bow before you and look forward to that day. But in the meantime, Father, I pray that our lives will give glory to you. And I come and I ask to Jesus in your name. Amen. In your name.
You know, the worship that we do is not just something we do here. It's something we should take with us every day, all day long. God tells us to pray continuously. We need to worship Him continuously. Uh, right? Let's stand together as we sing. Is it? 
of truth. Lord Saul, the Lord of truth. Our God is worthy, is he not? Amen. He is indeed. He is indeed. I'm going to ask you this week to go back with me to the book of Nehemiah, if you will. The book of Nehemiah. Chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2. I will begin reading with you. So if you will stand, please, when you find that. Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about it. It was very displeasing to them that someone had come to seek the welfare of the sons of Israel. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. And I arose in the night, I and a few men with me. I did not tell anyone what my God was putting into my mind to do. For Jerusalem was there and there was no animal with me except the animal on which I was riding. So I went out by night. I went out at night by the valley gate in the direction of the dragon's wall and on to the refuse gate, inspecting the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and its gates, which were consumed by fire. Then I passed on to the fountain gate and, and the king's pool, but there was no place for my mouth to pass. So I went up at night by the ravine and inspected the wall. Then I entered the valley gate again and returned. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done, nor had I as yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the rest who did the work. Then I said to them, You see the situation we are in, that Jerusalem is desolate and its gates burned by fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that it will no longer be a reproach. I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also about the king's words which he had spoken to me. Then they said, Let us arise and build. So they put up their hands, so they put their hands to the good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard it, they mocked us and despised us and said, huh, What is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? So I answered them and said to them, The God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, his servants, we will rise and build, but you have no fortune or memorial, no right in Jerusalem. Father, now we come to this passage of Scripture again as we have begun to go into the book of Nehemiah. And we understand, Father, that you gave Nehemiah a vision. And God, that then you did that which was required by your power and your omnipotence, God, to bring it to pass, to bring it to reality, to bring it to fruition. And God, thank you for giving us your word where we can look into this life of a man who shows us what you'll do when we act in faith. God, I ask for your word today as I preach your Father to be your word, not mine. Father, I pray that you will work in the hearts of our people. In me, Lord, I pray that this week and I pray it again now. Lord, you will work in the lives of your people and the heart of your people. And I come and I thank you for this chance for us to gather together to sit before you in your presence before the word. And I come in Jesus' name. Amen. I will begin by sharing with you a quote from J.I. Packer. You may not know him, but in my opinion, he is the greatest living theologian in the world today. J.I. Packer. Listen to what he said. He said, overall, the Western church has shriveled and shrunk. It has ceased to count as a community force. The faith of which God made it trusty is largely unknown to the man in the street. And when known, it is largely ignored. And the godliness of the church once set forth as true humanness is rated in popular culture as comic and old-fashioned oddity. The church appears as a ruined city. We too, like Nehemiah and the citizens of Jerusalem, are called to build. We are not erecting a physical city, but the church, the city of God. We do not build with bricks and cement, but with tools of firm prayer, powerful preaching, and zealous personal witnessing. With those who do not know the Savior, we will, encounter, we will encounter opposition. 
For the God of heaven who gave success to Nehemiah will give us success. And I say amen, J.I. Packer. That's the condition that we are in today as a church in America. We're a fallen city. We no longer stand. There's no one who gives any countenance at all to what we have to say and what the church is doing today. And in this passage of scripture, I entitled this message, Visions, Valleys, and Victories. Visions, Valleys, and Victories. Because all three are here. And I want us to look into that today, into the Word of God. To begin with, God has spoken. He has spoken to Nehemiah. He put a vision in Nehemiah's heart. And Nehemiah said, it's time to act. It's time to act. God has spoken. And he took a trip to Jerusalem. And we've read that the last two weeks. We've studied that and looked at that in the Word of God. It's not a weekend excursion by any means. It's a two-month hard journey to get there. But he takes his trip to Jerusalem. The enemy knew he was coming from verse 10, and it tells us they were not happy. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about it, it was very displeasing to them that someone had come to seek the welfare of the sons of Israel. They were angry that Nehemiah had come back with the intent to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. Now I'm going to go first of all to a verse in Proverbs that you've heard over and over again, but it's so vital into our lives to understand what it says and understand what it does not say. Proverbs 29, 18. It says, without a vision, what? The people perish. Without a vision, the people perish. But I want to talk about this word vision. What does that mean? Well, the first thing that it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean, well, preacher, what do you think the vision of this church is? It doesn't matter what my vision is. And it's not, well, what do you think the church ought to be? It doesn't matter what your vision is. That's not what it's saying here. Without a vision, because you see the word vision there is where the now prophet comes from. And the word for prophet in the Old Testament early on was seer, S-E-E-R. It is someone who saw what God said and therefore he announced it. And so you see a vision is not about a preacher's vision. It's not about a people's vision. It's not about a church's vision. It is about God's vision. It is God's passion being personalized into his people's heart. Oh, please hear me. That's what vision is all about. Don't ever let anyone come in and tell you what their vision is. That doesn't matter. You see, real vision in the Bible, the biblical vision, it is nothing more than the passion of our God in heaven being personalized in the hearts of his people. Vision is a picture of what God wants to do. What God wants to do. And he has put it in Nehemiah's heart to rebuild the walls. He has shown uh, Nehemiah what is in his heart. And Nehemiah has risen up to rebuild the walls. Now, in verses 11 and 12, we see that very clearly. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. And I arose in the night, I and a few men with me. I did not tell anyone what my God was putting into my mind to do uh, for Jerusalem. And there was no animal with me except the animal on which I was riding. Now, I want to share another quote with you from H. Beecher Hicks. You may not know him, but I've read behind him several times. He's a powerful preacher uh, from Washington, D.C., a black preacher, a powerful preacher. He said, vision casting requires, among other things, an indomitable faith in God's ability to provide beyond your ability to see or my ability to see or to make sense of our circumstance. Few visions, if any, emerge with all the necessary details in place. That is not the way God gives them. The authenticity of a vision does not rely on human understanding or the human ability to make the vision come to pass. Let me read that again. The authenticity, the realness of a vision does not rely on human understanding or on human ability or power to make the vision come to pass. Where there is God's vision, God makes provision. Do you believe that? What God desires, he gives the power to put into place. So often we think about, well, that's something I have to do as a pastor. I have to make this happen. I can't make this happen, not if it's God's thing. If it's God's thing, God makes it happen. 
when we're willing to buy in. Now in verses 12 through 15, we read them. What we find here is Nehemiah takes a secret survey, if you will. He goes out by himself, no one with him, goes out by himself. He did not draw a crowd. He didn't want anyone to interfere with what God was going to show him because he knew how he had brought him to Jerusalem and he wanted to see what God was saying continually to him. And so he makes an inspection, if you will. That word is used there. He is making an inspection of the city. It is a word that is used of a deep, it's used of doctors making a very careful, full examination of a wound. That's a word right there. That's what's being used. It's a deep probing to carefully diagnose the situation. That's exactly what Nehemiah is doing at night. God has put a vision in Nehemiah's heart. His vision, God's vision. And God's vision is essential for anything to happen anywhere. That's why I have been emphasizing so many weeks now, and we've been gathering. I'm grateful for the people who have responded. Not enough, but I'm grateful for those of you that have. But I want to encourage you to come and pray on Wednesday night. Why? Because we're wanting what God's vision is for this church. And we recognize that it has to be done by God's power and God's power alone. It's not going to be done by program. It's not going to be done by person. It's going to be by, done by God's people submitting and yielding to his vision and seeking his power. Now, vision gives us passion for the mission. That's where our passion comes from. And whenever you see a church or people who are passionate, passionate the problem is very simply that we do not have a mission for the master because it gives us uh, a mission, passion does, and passion is what helps fulfill that mission. We're to be busy with the mission until the master returns. What did Jesus say in Luke 19, 13? He said, occupy until I come. Occupy until I come. You know what that word means in the Greek? It means be busy with. Now, what are we to be busy with? Jesus is saying, be busy with my mission until I return. We talk about the Great Commission. There it is, right there in the middle of the Gospel of Luke. You see, the Master's mission is what is to occupy us. That is to be the burning passion in our lives as God's people, as a church. Do you feel like we need to seek God for that vision and for that passion? Talk back to me, please. Do you? Do you? Thank you, thank you. That's so very important. That's very, if we don't want the vision, God will not give the vision. And if we don't receive God's vision, he's not gonna give us any power. That's just the way that it is. And if our vision is less than an everybody vision, for every person, black, yellow, green, purple, pink, whoever walks in this church, it doesn't matter. If our vision is less than an everybody vision, then it is not God's vision. It may be our vision, but it's not his. That's why I said I feel like the Lord has laid on my heart a ministry for his families. The door is wide open here in this place for that. Now it may start small, but God can grow in a great way. And we need to be in prayer about that and see, God, is this really what you want us to do? Bring it to pass, Lord, empower it. We're going to move in that direction. And God, if it's not of you, then close the door. But if it is, open the door, Lord. And that's the way that it works. You see, God's vision always involves getting the gospel on the ground to everybody, everybody, every person. That's what it involves. Now, let me talk about two roots to a vision, if you will. One of them is the wrong root. Do you know what it is? It's tradition. Tradition. Tradition is the wrong thing to associate with a vision. It will not work. The right thing to put with a vision is mission. Christ's mission. Vision. God's vision. Always is impossible for a man or a church to achieve alone. Vision is how God gets loose in a church. All of a sudden, our hearts begin to be stirred and we become passionate about what God is moving us toward and it becomes exciting. It's not about who's here and who's not here. It's about God's here. And this is what he is doing. Soren Packard said this. He said, the age will not die from sin. 
but it will die from the lack of passion. Vision yields passion, and passion is yielded and given to us to empower us to do the mission of God. That's what he's saying to this church. This is what he's saying to churches all over, well, particularly in the Western world, but let's bring it down here to us. That is what he is saying to the Vine Baptist Church. Oswald Chambers, listen to what he said. He said something about vision that we need to hear. He said, we always have visions before a thing is made real. When we realize that although the vision is real, it's not real in us yet. Then is the time that Satan comes in with his temptations and with his trials. And it's at then that we are to say, it's no use. There's no need to go on to go any further. What a word, Oswald Chambers. Look at what I put on your handout today. On your handout, I'm going to share some truths with you that are so very important about vision. And understand vision, again, is not about my dream. It is about what God is wanting to do in this church. What is his dream? What is a plan? What is a vision? A vision is what gives life, a church, direction, and purpose. That's true for a personal life, and it's true for any church. If we don't have a, pers a purpose, we just come without passion. Nothing is really exciting. Nothing really matters. Why? Because we don't see God anywhere doing anything. And we say, what's the use? What's the use? And we become apathetic at that point. And vision is what gives us direction and purpose. Vision is where the future overrides the present. It doesn't matter what the present looks like. We're looking at the future that God has put in our heart. And this is what can be by his power because it is of him and not of us. And vision is where tomorrow is birthed and shaped. Vision is where the present and the future are brought together. Now, vision is what gives us the ability to see things that are not yet reality. It gives us the ability to see the things that are not yet as reality. God, I know it's not happened yet, but I can see it in my mind. I feel it in my heart, Lord. You put it in us. We know this is what you want to do. Vision is the ability to see things that are not as a reality, becoming a reality. Vision is how God executes and carries out his will. His will. Are you without passion in your personal life? If you're a Christian, you can have, you can have passion in your personal life. What you've got to do is find out what God's purpose for your life is. And then begin to pursue it all out, all out, all out, <laughs> holding nothing back, leaving nothing on the field. That's what passion does for a person and for a church. Think about what I put there about Hebrews 11. Faith, that's what Hebrews 11 is all about vision, and vision requires faith. It's all about faith. It's all about people who trusted God for the vision that he gave them to be able to make it a reality and to see it come to pass. That's what it's about. Now I want to share another truth with you that's so important. That is all visions come with a valley. All visions come with a valley. Look in verses 18 and 19. I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also about the king's words which he had spoken to me. We talked about how God did this, how he brought the king to allow Nehemiah to come back. Then they said, let us rise and build. So they put their hands to the good work. They're willing to go. They caught hold of the vision. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard it, they mocked us and inspired us to say, what is this thing that you were doing? Are you rebelling against it? Do you really think that you're going to amount to anything at all? And that's when Satan begins to gnaw at us. And that's when people begin to say, oh, it's done. We've had our glory days in the past. It's over with. We're not going to see anything like that again. And God's saying, who do you think I am? Am I not still on the throne? You see, it's important that we allow God to put his passion in our heart for the vision that he has given us. Our problem many times is we think the vision is the victory. Oh, I've seen the vision. It looks great. And we think that the vision is the victory. No, the vision is the beginning. 
But we cannot get from victory or from vision to victory without going through the valley. Hear me? You cannot get from the vision that God puts in your heart personally or in this church. We cannot get from vision to victory without going through the valley. There's always going to be opposition. There's always going to be tough times. The idea is, and the absolute necessity is, that we keep our eye on the vision and say, God, keep stoking the passion in my heart. Visions come with valleys. That's why many times we back away from the vision when God gives it to us because we begin to understand there's a valley that's involved. It's going to cost me something. It means that I can't wait on someone else to get up and do something. I have to do something right now. Right now. And we'll begin to back away because it's going to cost us too much. And it's in the valley that God purifies us as his people and purges us of the things that would be to his purposes for our lives. Let me say it again. It is in the valley that God purges us and purifies us of the things that would stop us from pursuing his purposes. And it's in the valley that God is able to hammer out the vision that he has put in our heart. And so the valley is a necessity, just as the vision is a necessity. And if we refuse to come down off of the mountain of vision and just dream about it and refuse to pay the price to go down into the valley, then we're going to find ourselves left on the mountain of vision alone. Even God's presence will not be there with us. We'll just be left with the vision. Think about that. The Mount of Transfiguration. What happened there? There were disciples there with Jesus, were they not? And they saw Jesus in all of his glory transfigured before them. And they began to say, what? Well, let us stay on the mountain. Let us build a tabernacle up here, Lord. Let us just stay right here in this place. And they were mesmerized by the vision. And they didn't want to go down off the mountain, back into the valley, because that's where the work was to be done. You remember what happened when they came back down? People were waiting on them. The disciples had tried to do something, some of them, and they did not have Christ with them. They did not have faith. They didn't have the prayer that they needed. They could do nothing. And Jesus went down into the valley. We've got to have him go with us, but we can't stay on the mountain because that's not what he intends for our lives. He intends for us to get into the valley and go to work. God's pattern is always, always vision to valley. Vision to valley. It's not vision to victory. It's vision to valley to victory. The victory is not one on the mountain, but it's one in the valley. And the vision is not kept alive on the mountain. It's kept alive in the valley. The vision is about fun. It's great fun to have that, to have that passion, to see what God's wanting to do in your life personally, in the life of the church. That's great fun. That's vision, but valley is about. Vision is about war or war. Valley is about work. Vision is about sight. Valley is about faith. Lord, I, I've seen what you want me to do and what you want this church to do. But the valley is where faith comes in. Well, I'm going to go work and do it, God. The truth is we cannot let the facts in the valley cancel out the faith of the vision. And that's what happens so many times. Because if we do, we will never find victory. Never. Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness because they let the facts cancel out their faith. There they were, 40 years, wandering, wandering. And churches, many of them, are in the valley. They've been in the valley. And the problem is, they let what? The facts cancel out. They, well, we just can't do it. We're just, we just have a few people. We're just this. We're just that. Who is God? He's just God. He's just God. He's just all powerful. And he's more than able. And so Israel is an example to us. Never doubt in the dark what God has shown you in the light. Never doubt in the dark what God has shown you in the light. Go into the valley and work, and it will come to pass. 
The only people who come out of the valley and enjoy victory, the only church is a, that enjoys victory, victory is a church that comes out of, the, out of the mountain of vision and goes into the valley, who hold on to their faith. Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame, for the joy that was set before him. That's what is required in all of our lives. That's why the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. No wonder our faith falters. We take our eyes off of him. The truth is that valleys are coming. The truth is that valleys are here. The truth is that valleys always come with enemies. The naysayers, it can't be. The critics who are always complaining. David had a vision, then came Saul. Saul, and he had to run for his life, David did, hide in caves. Elijah had a vision. He went to the mountain, the fire fell. He saw the power of God, but the real vision that he had was the restoral of Israel, but then came Jezebel. Joseph had a vision. Remember, he was 12 years old, had a dream, a young man, had a dream as a boy. Told his father, I'm going to be a great man someday. Told his brothers, I'm going to be a great man one day. But then came the valley. He went into Egypt, went into the pit, went into prison, went into Potiphar's house. What about Moses? He had a vision. And he tried it in his own power and it failed. And then came Pharaoh. God said, let me carry you to Egypt. I'll show you where I'll be. I want you to go back there and I'll show you that I can bring the very thing that was in your heart that you tried with your power to come to pass by my power. And the day came when Pharaoh said, you can go. You see, Nehemiah had a vision in verse 19. But he also had enemies. Let me share a truth with you. As a person and as a church, if we walk by faith, we will face the enemy. You believe that? Yes. If we walk by faith, we will face the enemy. Sometimes we'll be people. Just people like Tobiah and Geshem and Sandbach. Tobiah is an Ammonite official. He's a descendant of Lot. What do you expect? Geshem is an Arab official who knows nothing of God, the God of Israel. Sandbach, he's a Samaritan the Sumerian governor from the, and you know what his name means? From the house of the God of Horian. He is a pagan. He doesn't even believe in God. And these are the men that rose up as enemies to oppose Nehemiah and what God had given him as a vision. And opposition is always going to be there. We always feel like we bought the lie by Satan. That if we, if we love people and every, keep everything smooth, keep it peaceful, don't let there be any criticism and work it all out. And you've got to be a people person. And this kind of God's got to be God. And He's going to move everything and everybody aside according to His will and His wisdom in order to accomplish His vision when His people say, Yes. Yes. When they catch on with the vision, they say, Oh, God, yes. You see, there are some people who still live by Murphy's Law. It won't work. It just won't work. It just won't work. The truth is, when you walk by faith, you'll have a fight for those who walk by sight. When you walk by faith, you're always going to have a fight for those who walk by sight. Every one of these men had business investments in the citizens of Jerusalem. And they were not to, about to let God or his purposes shut their pocketbooks. And so they tried ridicule. And they tried rebellion. If you look in this chapter, what you find is the words good and evil repeated over and over. Rock and toad in the Hebrew. Over and over. Rock and toad. Evil and good. Good and evil. Good and evil. Evil and good. Underlying the actions in this chapter, there's a conflict between good and evil. And it wasn't there before. There was no conflict until Nehemiah came with God's vision. There was no conflict. Sandbound, Tobiah, Geshem. The clear implication in verse 10, if you go back and read it, is that the opposition to Nehemiah by these powerful leaders 
is a spiritual thing. It is a spiritual war we are in, that the church is in today. And we've got to wake up to that and understand that we're in a spiritual war and not be afraid and let God be God. It's a profound truth, and it's true for us, that if we're trying to serve God faithfully, when we make that decision, we're going to be engaged in spiritual warfare. Is that not what Ephesians 6 said? We do not rule with flesh and blood and powers and spiritual spiritual principalities. The problem is so often we always see as people. No, no, no. Look behind the scenes and see what's really going on. What's really going on is any attempt in any way by Satan to discourage God's people from saying, Lord, we're going to honor you. And I want your glory to be seen in this place. I want it to be you, Lord. And when we have a passion for that, God will bring the pass. Lewis Drummond, he said, history is replete with the fact that God often does what we least expect. At times, he uses bizarre methods, not to, not to mention unusual people. God's ways are simply beyond us. And it is certain that traditionalism, business as usual, will not precipitate a profound moving of the spirit. A business as usual attitude always seats the church bed with spiritual stagnation. Do you know what that means? That means we can't be afraid. We can't have it as it always was because we know what those days were like and they're saved. We can't step into the future because they're unknown and it's not saved. That spiritual stagnation may never be written on the tombstone of an evangelical Christian and on the church. What is engraved on the cemetery monument to the British soldiers at Lexington and Concord? These men came 3,000 miles to keep the past on the throne. The greatest risk, I've got it on your bulletin, look at it. The greatest risk that a church will ever take is refusing to take a risk when it's time to take a risk. When it's time to take a risk. Playing at safe is not faith. Are we playing to win? Fine, Baptist Church. Are we playing to win or to simply not lose? I have a football team named Georgia. Many times I've seen them play in the last few minutes not to lose. They refuse to play to win, play to win, play to win. Are we playing to save? Are we playing not to lose? Or are we playing to win? That's a challenge I want to make today to you and to this church. It's, it's time. It's time for this church to take upon themselves the challenge of saying, yes, we want God's vision. Yes, we want God's vision, and we understand that there may be valleys ahead and will be, but we believe God is God. And I'm willing to step forward and to just simply say, Lord, count me in. Count me in. I will be a part of making your vision come to pass. Of you once again, your passion and purpose being fulfilled in this church. I want to close with Amy Carmichael. Amy Carmichael, great saint of God. <coughs> I learned so many things from her in the book she's written. She said, God said, come to the edge. And we said, no, we'll fall. And God said, come to the edge. No, we'll fall. But they came to the edge and pushed them up. And they flew. That's God's promise. That's God's power. That's God's person. That's God's passion for this church. It's time to come out of the dolphins and for the fire and say yes. Or oh, we're ready to sail. But it's going to take each one of us being willing to serve in our spiritual giftings and to say, God, I want to see God pass. I want to see God pass. Don't look at this preacher and think I can ever make that happen. I cannot. Don't look at the next preacher. Whoever in your mind is a new baby. He can't make it come to pass. It's 
only before the job to people. Same just for the God's vision. That he infuses passion. That when we rise up, he makes it come to pass. I'm going to ask you to just simply think this. I've given you today that I give you the outline of this message on today. And if you were willing, the invitation is a simple one. You just sign the back of that. And just come forward and lay it here on this table as an offering to God. And so, Lord, I want to be. I want to be who you want me to be in this place, at this time, in this church. And I don't know what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to put out what we're going to call my Nehemiah team. And we're going to begin to put that together. I'm talking about the speakers today. I'm asking for a to speak. Putting together a Nehemiah team, because as you look further in the book of Nehemiah, you see the people there coming together, and some of them did this, and some of them did that. And just say, I don't know, God, what you want me to do, but I'm signing up right now. And that's the invitation this morning. And the invitation is for you. If you do not know Christ, you just simply put your name on the back of that. And to say, yes, I'm receiving Christ this day by faith, knowing that I am a man, a person who is broken by sin, undone, and Lord, I come. And by doing this, I simply say, Father, save me. I come to Christ believing in Him, believing that He came as God Himself in flesh, died on the cross for my sin, and I ask you to save me and forgive me. And it's done. And it's done. A simple invitation. I ask you to respond as God leads you. Father, I come and I pray. I pray that today we will be a turning point for this church. I pray, God, that you put passion and vision in the heart of your people. And God, we don't know who you're willing to bring and will bring. And we're not sitting here alone. We know your presence is with us and your power is available to us. I pray that we'll be bold and step out. Not fearing the battle, but desiring the vision. God bring it to pass in order that you might be glory. It's not about us, what we can say about this church. It's about you and who you are as God. And I come and ask it now, Jesus, in your name. Amen.